Monday, 9.30, prayer. Wednesday's canceled. Sunday, uh, January 4th, next week, communion. Uh, we need to advance, and we need to announce two weeks ahead of time of the financial report that will be available to the congregation about 15 minutes after service uh, on January 11th. All right. Uh, and the 25th teen challenge is here, and it's the men this year. I cannot resist sharing this piece. Harry S. Truman, everybody know who Harry S. Truman was? He was the President of the United States. Christmas Eve address, 1952. Through Jesus Christ, the world will be a better and fairer place. This faith sustains us today as it has sustained mankind for centuries past. This is why the Christmas story with the bright stars shining and the angels singing move us to wonder and stirs our heart to praise. Now, my fellow countrymen, I wish for all of you a Christmas filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit and many years of future happiness with the peace of God reigning upon this earth. Awesome. Awesome. You like that one? Let's go back a couple of years. 1949, Harry S. Truman. Since returning home, I have been reading again in my family Bible some of the passage which foretold this night. We miss the spirit of Christmas if we consider the incarnation as an indistinct, doubtful, far-off event unrelated to our present problems. We miss the significance of Christ's birth if we do not accept it as a living link which joins us together in spirit as Christians of an ever-living and true God in love alone. The love of God and the love of man will be found, will be found the solutions of all the ills that will affect that which affect our world today. Amazing, isn't it? Now, t I'll be frank with you guys. I, I was looking this week for a, and considering a, a biblical bridge I'll also be absolutely frank and upfront with you. That we need to live our lives every day as if we're meeting him. as if we're walking with him. That there is no need to upgrade our lives or downgrade our lives when we meet him. He, we are what he wants us to be. I was considering a biblical bridge from the celebration of Jesus' birth to the reason of the coming year. It's common to listen to reason for the season but what is my reason? What is my expectation for the coming season, the new year? I've explored to some extent Paul's writing in Philippians. I've looked and read some of Rick Renner's material, Andrew Womack's, various other people, various commentary, commentaries and Bible dictionaries. Let me be frank with you again. It tears me up when I walk into a group of Christians and their motive is not to be one. I found something else. It tears him up when our motives is not him First in our relationships. T. 
do you expect us all to get along? I expect us all to make room for one another. He made room for me. He made room for you. A conclusion began to emerge. Natural man desires power and many times will sacrifice character for their personal goals. Spiritual man has received power, desires to be used, that power to flow through them. But I propose to you that that all should happen from a platform of character. Character defined by Webster, a symbol always the same, A, B, C, one, two, three. Computer picks it up always the same. Character marks a person or group. Character marks moral excellence or the opposite. Character, a person's usual quantity, qualities or traits. Traits. Character is engraved and it's inscribed. It can be read. Let me tell you. Now that's Webster, but let me tell you LL version of this. Can I do that? Godly character should be fixed. It doesn't float. Again, LL's version of character. Godly character should be fixed. It doesn't float. It cuts through the waves. It doesn't float. My, my, my. Uh, basically, I feel like I want to cry. I, you know, that's an abnormality for me. Well, let's just continue on. I said there were three points to the message today. Jesus is made in the likeness of men at birth. I wanted to bridge Christmas into the new year or the celebration of Christ's birth. Philippians 2, 6 and 7 says this, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. At this time of year, believers all over the world celebrate the birth of Christ. There has been given times that in the world where fighting has ceased so they could celebrate this event together, opposing armies. The, can you see in the midst of a conflict, you're shooting at one another and trying to hit one another. that you stop to celebrate the birth of a child. Mm, mm, mm. Why wouldn't you give him priority? Why wouldn't you say yes and amen? His birth is one of the greatest miracles that has ever occurred, for it was a moment when God Almighty laid aside his glory, appeared on earth as a man, 
How wonderful, how marvelous to think that God would temporarily shed his divine appearance and actually take on the flesh of men. This is so precisely what happened the day that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Precisely. Verse 6, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Paul begins by describing the pre-existence of Jesus before he came to earth. Who being in the form of God, he always existed. He existed eternally, always was, always will be. John 8, 58 says, before Abraham was, I am. He always existed in the form of God. Jesus' human birth was not his beginning, merely his manifestation as a man in a brief appearance in his eternal existence. Got it? Who being in the form of God was just not a component of God nor a symbol of God. He was God. He was God. As the eternal God himself, Jesus possessed the very shape and outward appearance of God, a form that included great splendor, glory, power, and presence so strong that no flesh could endure it. God existed in glory more wonderful than the human mind can comprehend and more powerful than human flesh can endure. Yet he came to earth to purchase the redemption of man. Therefore, in verse 7, Jesus made himself of no reputation, emptied himself, took upon him the form of a servant, and made the likeness of men. There is your story of Christmas. To make empty, he had to change his outward form. For 33 years he walked this earth, divested himself of his heavenly glory, and took upon him the form of a servant. God, from his eternal existence, reached into the natural world he had created and took human flesh upon himself, again the form of a servant. Now Jesus existed in the exact form of man, appearing and living on earth in exactly the same way as every other man. For a brief time, Jesus literally became man in every way. He took upon him Self, the form of a slave or as the servant. There's a vast difference. Paul paints a picture of, of Jesus' pre existent state and his earthly life. Jesus was made in the likeness of men. So completely made in the likeness of men that Hebrews 4.15 declares he was even tempted in every way that man was tempted. It says, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. <clears throat> How does that go down? How does that affect my life, our lives? You know what? You know what Philippians 2 5 says? Let's look at it together. He introduces this subject. Paul introduces this subject by saying, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God took upon himself the form of a servant. Mm, 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 mm. You begin to get it? Wow. God wants us to have the same mind or attitude that was demonstrated in Jesus. You say, Lynn, you're just raising this out of all proportion. I don't think so. We need to let the word become a living reality manifested in our lives and in our footsteps of life, in our emotions. You 
This is, from his perspective, very serious. Just as Jesus was willing to go this incredible distance to reach us, to love us, and to redeem us, we should desire to do the same for others. Wow. So one, Jesus made in the likeness of men at birth. Two, to suffer, die, and be resurrected to glory. After Jesus' crucifixion and death, Joseph of Arimathea took Jesus' body, wrapped it in linen, laid it in a tube, tomb made out of a rock. Where did they find him? In a manger, the shepherds did. Very likely a rock, hollowed out for a manger. Now, he was wrapped in his birth in swaddling cloths. He didn't get fine new remnant, as far as I know. He was wrapped in swaddling cloth. Doesn't say clothes, it says cloth. What is that? Strips, they say. As I go look it up. Strips of cloth. Is that common? I do not know. But that's how he was, and laid in a manger. And that's what the angel said would be a sign. You'll find a child in a manger and swaddling cloth. Jesus would one day be wrapped in linen and laid in the tomb. He said, but this is Christmas or Christmas time. Rarely, perhaps, does people think of the cross at Christmas time. It's time set aside to celebrate Jesus' birth. But Philippians 2.8 connects the thought. And being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He connects the birth and the death. Consider the greatness of God's love that drove him to divest himself of his splendor and become a man. Is this amazing to you? The thought of humbling yourself or preferring Someone else above yourself? How does that go down? As Jesus humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The word obedient tells us something. This was not a pleasurable experience, nor did Jesus anticipate it. Knew it was coming. Hebrews 12.2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured or stayed under the cross, despising the shame, is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We're seated with him. Do we live like him? Is it a want to? Without a want to, it'll never happen. You say, well, you think we're not? I'm not even saying that. I'm just saying keep the focus single. Dad would always used to tell me, he says, and Zach and I went looking it up because it become, the little fox tears up the vines. The little fox. Wow. Rick Renner says, I hear in this word obedient that you're under authority, listening to what your spirit is saying, your superior is saying, carrying out the orders that have been given to them. This is what the word obedient means in this verse. And that is what obedience means for you and I. Just think of it. Almighty God, clothed in radiant glory from eternity past, came to earth, formed as a human being in the womb of a human mother for one purpose, so that he would one day die a miserable death on a cross to purchase our salvation. You say this, 
pretty heavy this morning, pretty truthful this morning. Listen, in Philippians 2, going back to the start of the chapter in verse 1, saying this, if there be therefore any consolation, now consolation, that's a big word, any consolation in Christ, any calling near, or supplication, exhortation, encouragement, persuasive discussion or discourse, any comfort of love, fellowship of the Spirit, or tender mercies. We got that? Think of that. Because we are about to launch into the third point of this, that man may be made in the likeness of God. I'm just not talking about something that's a figment of somebody's imagination. I'm talking about the likeness of God in you're thinking. You say, well, I have to be renewed. Yes, have to want to be, have it renewed. Just not when it's convenient. Verse 2 of the same scripture. Fulfill ye my joy that you be what? like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves, and we are oh so good at it. That is really our want to. You say you're sarcastic. No. Not, I'm just saying that as if was your thought. Change it. Have you ever had to change your, many times. Quite regularly, when Zach and my wife calls me pastor. Because they think what I am demonstrating at that point, that I need to pay attention to these verses. It's no different for any of us, me, you, people outside. It's all the same. He wants us to be like-minded. And it will require some changes. <laughs> mm -hmm. If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any tender mercies fulfill ye my joy <laughs> bowels of mercy that inside you fulfill ye my joy that ye be like minded like minded to whom huh him you say I prefer to think it's Paul well you could do that but I prefer to think it's him I don't you know as good as Paul was I I think it's him. Wow. You know what that would do to me? I have to change my thinking, actions, and words. Yes and amen. Just, just as pastor would have to change his thinking when I am reminded. They don't back up. I'll tell you quite frankly, they don't back up. They just keep working on me. Pastor? Pastor? I got it. But the Spirit of God is on board. The Godhead is in us to cause us to be like-minded. Having the same love God is love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife 
or vainglory, empty glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. Did you pray that? <laughs> okay. I don't want to get too personal. Too late. <laughs> I see too late, Ruth says. That's my wife's talking to me. Too late. I've got personal. Wow. If on the one hand, all these count for anything, if they have any effect, then on the other hand, the results should show. Absolutely. The joy of this shall then be made full, complete, rendered it a perfect joy by proving themselves true Christians in all things, especially in the respect that they love one another in true unanimity of thought. And we've already discussed the harmonious unity and the expression in this as these verses continue. To this, the apostle adds, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Basically, in humility regarding one another, more excellent than yourselves. You say, well, they're not more excellent than me. Hang on. <laughs> you know, we have got such confused thoughts. Who did Jesus die for? You. Who else did he die for? Any of us here. But the thing that I think escapes us, that vile, vile, unclean person, his sins is already forgiven. Hello? Hello? He's only waiting for him to make him Lord. That's all. He will not have to beg, scrape, ball, kick, squirm, crawl. He will not have to do penance. He'll have to make Jesus Lord. And then follow him. I don't care what he did to you. I don't care how he mistreated you. I don't care. What foul, uncouth things he said to you. His sin is already forgiven. Whew. All he needs to do is make Jesus Lord, just like you. You know, I understand. It'd be hard for you to believe that anybody could say this of your pastor. I used to go see this particular lady. I, she would talk spiritual things with me. Not everybody would talk spiritual things with me. They just would not. You know, sometimes it's not, it's not their normal, everyday verbiage, thoughts. Everything else becomes their, their everyday thoughts. And not spiritual things. She'd talk to me about spiritual things. Now I want to tell you something. She endured well. Because one day after that sometime in our course of existence, she looked at me and said, I never did like you. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha, <laughs> whoop de doo What'd you do? I didn't, I, maybe it was because I was sitting on her counter. I don't know. I was treating her house like I'd treat my own if I could reach it. I don't know. But all she said was, I never did like you.
Well, bless God, what would you do? You know, I didn't faint, I didn't pass out, I didn't even get excited. I thought, well, hello, another shoe has just dropped. She has to deal with that, not me. <laughs> you know, I can still remember her saying that. You say, you forgive her? Yes. Because that was only a start. There was various other things that happened. But that be that as it may. You know, she also didn't agree theolog theologically with me. Took great exception. Publicly. What'd you do? Just taught what God gave us to teach. And she, she had to settle the issue with herself and him. Not me. Did you do it to antagonize her? Not so. Never. You see, when you know where the word is coming from, you don't have to back up from it. If you know what it's communicating is truth, you don't have to back up from it. Have you ever backed up from it? Very rarely. You say, well, you must have sometime. Well, I got hung up one day in a... Where are they? Oh, the name escapes me. It's a community building where they go to exercise. Well, it's a gym. It's a, it's a place. It's in the old days before they had these fancy other terms. Huh? You know, it was, well, anyhow, you got the idea. <laughs> so, what happened, Lynn? <laughs> I was asked, the, the church was building a new church. They had sold their old building. Uh, and they rented this building, and they asked me to preach. And I can remember just as clear as a bell. We was ministering the word along, and all of a sudden I knew what was next, and I knew who was sitting there. I said, did I load this gun deliberately? Ruth asked me that yesterday. <laughs> I said, no, ma'am, I did not. I didn't then either. Because what, I, what we did at that point in time, he gave me something else in place of that statement, and we issued that and just walloped somebody over here. I didn't do it. You know, it's great when you don't do it planned purposefully, when the Spirit of God sets his seal to it and delivers it. Glory, I tell you. Yes. Whoa. So, look not everyone on his own interest, but also on the interest of others. I'll sit down to do this one. I got a little star out beside this paragraph. Let me give it to you this way. Selfish ambition, which brooks no interference, and picks a quarrel at the slightest provocation, which, which seeks only its own interests and ends, and tries to exalt itself at the expense of others, should not exist in the midst of a Christian congregation. Okay. Selfish ambition which brooks no interference and picks a quarrel at the slightest provocation, which only seeks its own interest and ends and tries to exalt itself or themselves at the expense of others, should not exist in the midst of a Christian congregation. And you, do you know anybody like I hear? No. Let me go on record. I'm just, it's just part of this. Now, Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Let me do that, and we'll get to the conclusion of this this morning. Wherefore, 
God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. That is the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of things in heaven, things or beings in earth, things, beings under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, I like this. Let me read you 9 again, and we'll move on to verse 10. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name. You got that name. You got the right to use that name. That has been delegated to you, that name, as believers. Correct? You get to use his name. Right? You signed the checks. Correct? They're cleared. At the, they're cleared. They, they work. This is a legal transaction in the spiritual realm. Now, verse 10. Wow. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things, beings in heaven, things, beings in earth, things, beings under the earth. What are you saying, Lynn? There's a day coming, and you're free to report this wherever you want to report it, by the way. Is that all right with you? That you report this wherever you want to report it? Okay, here you go. A day is coming when those in heaven, earth, and hell will bow their knees in honor, respect, humility, and worship of Jesus Christ. It is not a question of if people will bow their knees to Jesus. It is only a question of when and how they will do it. Will they freely do it while still living on the earth? Or will they do it from the vantage point of hell? It says all things above the earth, on the earth, or under the earth. Is that what it says? That's what it says. Everyone will bow, including those who have already died and gone to heaven, those who are still alive when Jesus comes, and those who have died and are eternally separated from God. All will bow their knees in acknowledgement of Jesus Christ's lordship. Why don't we do it every day? Or we do do it every day. We should say, thank you, Lord, for giving me the, the ability and the strength and the grace to accomplish this. Because you don't do it in yourself or your own strength. You don't, your commitment, your want to, is to live. As he wants you to live. Wow. And this bending of mankind's knees in acknowledgement of Jesus' lordship will, in no, will be no quiet affair. For Philippians 2.11 goes on to tell us, Every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Got it? The word confess refers to a confession which taken as one word. It means to audibly, vocally, publicly declare a fact. It all, <laughs> the fact is Jesus is Lord. That's the fact. It also means to speak out, to yell it loudly, or to declare it out. This means heaven, earth, and hell will re resonate and resound with the voices of all who have ever lived as they thunderously shout and acknowledgement or acknowledge Jesus is Lord. Just as ever knee shall bow is also a fact every person will confess that Jesus is Lord. If a person confesses Jesus to be his Lord right now in his life, it guarantees him a place in heaven. If a person refuses to make that confession, he will still do it later. But then it will be too late. I ran Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon, I run Ruth to town. Uh, she would have been baking and doing things in the kitchen, and she said there's some things she needed, and uh, so I, I ran her to town. I found out Myers was busy Wednesday afternoon, you know, Christmas Eve, but, you know, 
I pulled around because she went in. I said, you know, she graciously accepted that she would do it and got in. I pulled the car around and I found a parking spot. And it was right in the first lane off, just about the first lane off center. I nosed into it. Then the car ahead of me moved out. So I moved out into that parking spot. So now I'm facing out. I'm also seeing all the people walking by. You know what happened to me there that afternoon for the few minutes that Ruth was gone? I looked at these people. And I have to say, I looked at them perhaps in a fashion I maybe had never looked at them before. Here they come. Here they come with carts of stuff. There they went with nothing. Here they come with carts of stuff. I looked at those people and thought, my God knows who these people are. He's forgiven them their sins already. What I need to do is recognize who needs to know that he's already forgiven their sins and he loves them and all they have to do is make him Lord. And I thought rather than go out there and just grab each one as they went by because that's normally not my method of operation. If you can do it, you help yourself. I thought Holy Spirit knows. Help me to recognize opportunities to witness, to share with people who need to confess Jesus Christ as Lord of their lives. Help me to do that. Help me see. Then help me be willing to do that. Wherever it is. This is an ongoing thing, folks. I've sensed this week, you maybe will hear more about character in the coming year. Father, you sent your son to on the, put off the form of God, put on the form of man, so to speak. He was yet God. He was the son of God. He was also the son of man when he walked this earth. But the glory that he had with you before the world was, he didn't bring with him. Yet he had glory on earth, same glory that you've given to the children here in this room this day and who hears us over the internet in the days to come. They too have received your glory, the glory you've had on earth. There's coming a day when we'll receive the glory that was given to the Son when he came back to the Father. That glory will be manifest. We'll know it and enjoy it and be able to partake in it free. We would that more people would make the trip with us or because of your ministry through us that more will make the trip. More will enjoy the journey of life here and enjoy the journey to you there or with you there because we do have you here. Thank you. Thank you that you do see us through Jesus Christ. Thank you. Our names are written in the book of life. Thank you. Our destiny is approved. Our going with you is assured. 
We still have a life to live while we're here. May we live it with full consciousness of a determination to live it in you to the fullest extent for each one of us. Will we be perfect? Unlikely. Will we be perfect in your view? Yes. Help us to love as we should love. Help us to be like-minded with you. You came in the likeness of man, placed your likeness inside us when we believed. But our external people, persons, our thoughts need to come into submission with your thoughts. I thank you for the privilege. I thank you for the satisfaction, pleasure that will give us to conform to you. Praise, honor, and glory is all yours. For it is we receive of your goodness and mercy and receive confidence and assurance and peace in you. Thank you. Jesus' name. Amen.